So my name is Leonard Katz. I'm with uh, Cloud9. It's a startup, uh, well, it was a startup. We founded it about five years ago. Um, this year we were bought by Amazon. Um, and we'll be making this, we're making this online IDE. This is my team. That's why you're here, so happy. Uh, this is our IDE. Um, and one thing you'll notice, it's in the browser. It's an online ID. All you need is a browser, any laptop, any computer anywhere. And you'll get uh, like error marking, uh, thinness highlighting, uh, code completion, jumps to definition, uh, split views, outline view. It's, it's a fully fast ID. Um, we even run like a terminal inside this ID. So we can run processes there. We can run your code there. We can run a debugger there. We can check through your code. Um, and well, building something like that is quite quite difficult. Um, but I'm going to get to that. First, um, yeah, why online IDEs? Why would you bother making an online IDE? I mean, like Eclipse is fine, right? Is it? No. Um, so one of the, the like the early slogans we had for Cloud9 was uh, it's like Google Docs for code. And I never really liked the slogan, but uh, it does kind of explain the value proposition for a lot of people. It's like uh, Google Docs makes it so you can use your Word document anywhere. You just share a URL with a colleague and they can also edit this document. Um, you can collaborate on these documents together. And, and th that's the kind of experience we wanted for IDEs. Um, we also provide uh, uh, templates. So if you want to work on, uh, say, uh, a WordPress project, a cloud-based IDE can give you a template and you have a starting point and you don't need to install everything. You don't need to download the latest WordPress. Uh, it's just there in the cloud. Uh, another e uh, application is education. So uh, Harvard and uh, Princeton have this massively online course, CS50, uh, and they use uh, Cloud9 to distribute uh, well their software, their dependencies, their IDEs to students. Students don't need to install anything. They just go to a URL and they have uh, an environment where they can actually do like coding rather than installing these things and debugging them and asking student assistants, uh, doesn't work on my laptop, can you have a look? All right. Um, so architecturally, there's often a it's uh, often a misconception when I, I talk to people about uh, you know, having an IDE that, IDE that runs in the browser. Um, so one thing you'll notice is that well it runs in the browser and it, it seems to run your code. It runs your Python code, it runs your Java code, it runs your C code. How can it do that in the browser? That's what people ask. Well, the answer is actually fairly obvious. I mean, the browser connects to the cloud to a large cloud of hosting machines that have what we call workspaces, workspace containers. So if you run your C code, it actually runs in a virtual machine in the cloud. Uh, if you're debugging your C code, stepping through it, it's just sending messages from the browser to your debugger to step, to step through it. So this is an important like architectural picture to keep in mind. This uh, I'm going to look at this a few times in my presentation. Um, and yeah, building an IDE like this, um, yeah. picture seems simple, but it's really not not easy to build one, an IDE like this. It took us five years to get where we are now. <coughs> and web technology has matured a lot. There's a lot of open source components these days. Some of us, uh, some of them have been double up, like the Ace Editor. Uh, but yeah, you have to deal with web technology, so uh, Ajax, WebSockets, Service Workers, and all these browsers and changing standards and, and all these things. Um, we had to deal with hosting. I mean, we need to needed to host our large application that is used all over the world in different regions by many users, and it, it always needs to be up. And people are running their code there, and they, they expect uh, to work on it eight hours a day and not be interrupted. That is very hard. And then you actually want to build a good idea as well. 
and we have users using PHP, Java, uh, lots of dynamic languages, Python, for example, we have Go users, uh, many languages, and we want to support these languages. You need to provide some support more than just basic uh, tapping ASCII characters and running it. We, we want language tooling, things like code completion, things like marking errors in the code. Um, so we, we have set some guiding principles. Um, first principle is don't build everything yourself. Just use existing tools for when you can. I mean, if you build an online IDE now, uh, please use our Ace Editor or use CodeMirror or one of the other open source alternatives. Um, next is just focus on the parts that actually differentiate your tool. It's, it's not this editor. I mean, everybody has an editor. Everybody has a file tree. Uh, there's like IDEs that have uh, an editor and a file tree and it they call it an IDE, but that, that's not it. Um, and rule number three is probably best uh, you only hire people for number three. This is like my hidden agenda here. Um, so, um, language tooling. Now, what, what, what is language tooling? Um, language tooling encompasses many things <coughs> when it comes to IDEs. There's things like uh, jumping to definition, there's syntax highlighting, there's marking errors, there's quick fixes, there's code completion. And that's a big one, code completion. That's the first thing people are going to ask about. I mean, whenever you type anything in an IDE, you'll get code completion. That's the, the main differentiating factor compared to editors for most people. So this is also what I'm going to focus on in this presentation. And the interesting thing about code completion is that latency is incredibly important. Because we have this architecture where there's a client and there's, there's some lines and there's a server. And the server is maybe in a different country. So there's, there's going to be latency. So how can we still do code completion in such, a, such an architecture? Um, let, you, let me show you with what I mean with like responsive code completion. I mean, this is code completion for Python. Um, and this is a fairly old uh, animated GIF. But uh, wha what you'll notice there is that whenever you type any character, there's code completion. I mean, classic IDEs used to have this notion where when you type some characters and you hit control space to hit code completion. No longer works like that. Any character, there's code completion, there's tooltips, always. So any character they type, you need to be able to provide some kind of feedback, some kind of feedback that helps developers. And um, well, we want to build something like this and, and apply our rule number one, we use existing tools for building these things. Um, and Interestingly, yeah, I've seen this problem in other talks in this conference, but uh, there's the end-to-end -end problem. Uh, there's, there's many languages. Like the, the Ace Editor supports over 100 languages. But there's also many editors, many IDEs. So what often happens is that uh, in the verticals, like Eclipse, people are building stuff for Java support, people are building stuff for Scala support. But Actually, building those verticals doesn't really translate to, say, Vim. Um, so there's all these different people building these tools. But building this entire matrix is very hard. And whenever someone builds something for Eclipse, imagine how hard it's going to be to translate that to Cloud9. So yeah, many languages and many editors. And maybe even more of these language tools. So. I've been seeing a, a development, though, in this area. I've been seeing that, I mean, when I started working on IDEs, it really was like this picture. But nowadays, you type, like, code completion library Python into Google, um, and someone made some library. And this library is used by, by Vim, it's used by Emacs. Uh, there's uh, Sublime, there's Eclipse integrations. 
there are just libraries out there these days that people use and integrate into the tools. And, and Jedi is a nice example of that for, for Python. So with Jedi, just, just all the hard work, all the heavy lifting and code completion. That's awesome. So th th some of these new portable language tools now. <coughs> and uh, let's have a look at some of them. So Jedi is one of them. Uh, it rewards the Python language. It's, it's written in Python. Uh, there's an API in Python. And yeah, well, it's, it's going to need file system access. It needs to see your entire project. There's other examples like yeah, server for TypeScript. Supports one language, TypeScript. It's wr written in that same language. Th this is a common pattern. You see that the tool is written in the language it's meant for. I mean, it's written by that community, by that group of people like TypeScript, so they build a TypeScript uh, completer. And in this case, the interface is not actually in TypeScript, it's like JSON message-based protocol. And they're working on documentation on script. And yeah, it, it needs file system access. All, all these things need file system access. So for Go code, uh, for Go, there's Go code. It's also a library just like this. Um, it's actually very nice how they did that. Um, it supports the Go language written in Go. You can use it from the CLI. That's actually very cool if you just want to prototype something or, there or there's an API if you want. Um, there's some tools also that support many languages. And that's actually an interesting take on this end-to-end -end problem. So Code Intel is a library that supports, I think, 15 languages or something. But it's also meant for use in many editors. So someone made uh, Sublime Code Intel. It's a Sublime plugin that integrates Code Intel. So then suddenly you have support for 15 languages. And well, Code Intel itself is written in, in Python. There's a Python API. And yeah, it's going to need file system access. So th there are these generic tools out there now. And uh, I find it interesting that it's, it's all implemented in different languages. They all have their own different interfaces. Um, and as a commonality, they all need file system access. They need to see the entire project to give some kind of code completion or some kind of uh, error markers and whatnot. And that last one is, is kind of interesting since well, these, these tools, they kind of assume that they're in the desktop world, that they don't run in a browser. They assume that um, everything is local. All the files are local. Whenever you need to do code completion, you just look at the local files around you. <coughs> but that's not really how we work, though. <laughs> um, so let's look a bit at uh, Python, and, as, and I'll show you how we integrate that into Cloud9. So um, one thing that, that might be the, like the most obvious way to integrate uh, the Jedi library is to do a thin client per approach. So in a browser, we don't do all that much. We're just going to send messages requesting, hey, can you code complete this? This is my document. And on the server side, oh, we can run Python code. In the browser, that, that's a bit harder. You need to do all this code compilation business, and let's not do that. Um, so you can run the Jedi library on the server. Um, and then the main thing is that there's still latency. You still need an HP connection here, you need an SH connection there. There's going to be latency. If you want to compete with every character they type, that, that is tricky. Um, so, yeah, you, you're seeing a couple of things with this, this kind of architecture. One is the asymmetry of computing power. So the, the cloud, in theory, is, is like this hugely scalable, unlimited resource. In, in practice, it's not quite like that, but uh, let's pretend it is. In the front end, there's a, a laptop running JavaScript, which has, it, it is actually very fast these days, but it has limited capacity when it comes to analyzing entire projects uh, like with like a million lines of code. And there's asymmetry of information so because the browser doesn't have those million lines of code. Um, the browser can only download them one file at a time if it, if it needs to, but really the code is on the server side. 
So if we're going to do a, a thin client solution, what we can do is uh, we do a post request. Whenever someone hits a key, do a post request. We send this current like un unsaved document with the current changes to the server. I do 27k. It might be more. Um, we wait for the server, and th this kind of works. I, I've seen people do this. I've, I've seen people still do doing this. Um, but latency is horrible when you do this. Don't do this. Um, so what can we do to make this faster? I mean, yes, it's, it's an agent superhighway, right? It's too fast. It's not. Uh, we have latency and we have bandwidth limitations. Latency is is very nasty since it's so un unpredictable. I mean, like here in Amsterdam, I usually have less than 50 milliseconds latency to the Cloud9 data center. Uh, there's we have a number of data centers around the world, so it's like that for a great deal of our users, but it's not like that for all our users. It's also not like that when I'm in the train uh, tethering. And then we also see these big spikes in latency. So latency is unpredictable, and we want to avoid any kind of latency. The other thing is bandwidth limitations. So I have a colleague in Armenia, for example, who doesn't have great internet. There's there's many people using it in, in countries where bandwidth is limited, and we cannot send very big messages like this 27k with every keystroke. So. Um, uh, let's first do away with uh, doing a post request with the entire document. Um, what you should do instead is use WebSockets. So just have an open connection to the server and just change your incremental changes to your docu document to the server. So WebSockets connection and operational transform. It's an algorithm uh, made popular by Google and they uh, implemented this in Google Docs. And it allows you to send like tiny chunks of changes that people write to some central location. Uh, you can use this to have people collaborate. So multiple people send these chunks of changes and the OT protocol sort of specifies how th these changes sh should be merged. Uh, or we can just use it to send these changes to the server and then do some kind of analysis there, so like code completion. So, so tha that's the first thing I do for code completion. Just use operational transform, just send these changes and use WebSockets. There's a few more things you can do. Um, so there's WebSockets. Modern browsers also support GZIP compression in WebSockets. Th this used to be very nasty in WebSockets that, <laughs> like a post request, there's usually GZIP compression these days. But uh, WebSockets didn't have that. But modern browsers have this. So every frame, every message you send to the server, it can be compressed. That's very helpful. Makes it faster. Um, Another thing you can do is asynchronous completions. So if you know some kind of completion information locally, maybe like a simple word completion or some cached completion, you can do getting more complicated completions or getting documentation strings asynchronously and then change the compl completion pop-up uh, as you get that information. There's also a bunch of other tricks you can do. So um, I noticed GZIP compression is, is awesome, but if you have a large JSON blob, for say uh, NumPy. NumPy has like a million methods. They all have these big documentation strings. Um, and every time it's going to be the same methods. Every time you show that completion. So you should do use memoization so you don't have to show the same list. have to send over the same list every time, every completion. So yeah, that, that's great. So the information highway is a bit faster. But can we do better? Um, so we, we looked at the language generic kind of optimizations so far. Th they don't care about what's the lang language. They work for any language. They work for Python, they work for Java. They don't care. Um, what can be interesting is to look at optimizations specific to these languages. So what if you know a little bit about the Java language or the Python language or whatever language? Can you make this even better? Maybe then you can decide, oh, I can do caching because I know there's these locals in scope and they were in scope before and let's just, just show them again and not ask the server. You can do things like free caching where you're like, oh, this user's going to type this and this and I can already ask the server about that and I can show it uh, just before they type it. It's great. 
uh, you can do predictions where you actually show this kind of information to users. Um, there's a lot of things you can do just based on a bit of language knowledge. So th that's what I call language parameters. So language information is a parameter to these kinds of optimizations. And I don't want everybody who's going to build uh, like a Go completion plugin for Cloud9 to build all this by hand. I just want to have like ready-made algorithms and you just specify some kind of parameter, some kind of specific information about your language. And uh, suddenly your information highway is faster. Um, so here are some examples of, uh, of these language parameters. So one parameter can be the parser. I mean, if you can parse Java, for example, suddenly you know a lot more about the language, about the, the structure. You know that, oh, this is an identifier, I can complete that. Or, oh, this is a keyword, I don't, I don't care, let's not ask the server about that. Um, you have even more information if you have a semantic analyzer. Um, but there's also smaller things. You can actually learn a bit about the language just from the syntax highlighter, just ha looking at token structures. Um, even just having a list of keywords can be helpful for optimizing these kinds of completions and optimizing caching. So these things are kind of like low-hanging fruit because well people happen to have written a parse for Java, but maybe not for my obscure uh, I know Apex language. So if I want to do co completions for this Apex language, it would be great if I could just write like a handful of uh, regular expressions, a little bit of JavaScript code, and not write a fully fast parser for this language or even a semantic analyzer that's going to cooperate with the server. That, that, that sounds like a lot of work and we're lazy, right? Um, yeah, so regexes. I'm going to use regexes. Uh, and regular expressions are actually great. I mean, they're like a DSL in languages like JavaScript uh, for writing parsers very concisely. They're amazing. So you can do like very little bit of local parsing based on regexes. They're, they're somewhat hard to read sometimes, but they're great. Um, so yeah, we're going to do language parametric optimization here. So what's that going to look like? So again, you have the Jedi library in the back. So in the front, uh, you have this completion client, and it knows a little bit about Python. It doesn't reproduce everything that Jedi knows about Python, which which is uh, a lot, and it does reflection and a lot of complicated things. But it just has a little bit of information there to make it go faster. So the, the first thing we can do is look at uh, completion triggers and caches. Um, so you can see that a bit with an example like this. So this is a, a snippet of Python code. And imagine that for every character here, you're going to send a post request to the server. If people type slowly enough, that, that's going to be OK. Uh, if they're also compiling something in the server, I mean, their workspace, they can do whatever they want. It's going to be worse. If they're fast typers, it's going to be worse. If there's unpredictable latency, it's going to be worse. You want to do as few of these requests as possible. So you don't want to do it with every character. But you want to give people the impression that you're doing that. You want to give people the impression that every <coughs> character they type matters and it's going to improve your feedback and it's going to give feedback just based on that. So one thing you'll see is with caching. So say they're, they're typing URL. You're going to show, well, ask the server, show regressions for URL and URL parse. Then they type this letter P. A completely naive implementation would just go ahead and ask the server again. So I have this URL P. How do I complete that? A slightly smarter one would actually look at, hey, this is an identifier. It's slightly longer than it used to be. I had this list with URL, URL parse. Take all the ones that have this prefix, and you can keep doing that. And th there's a tiny bit of language-specific information already there. I mean, apparently you know that this is an identifier. And apparently you know that, know that these are just prefixes. Uh, what you also see is that uh, after a dot, for example, in Java, Python, a lot of languages, you, c you see completion pop up. That's what we call a trigger. So we have 
triggers and identifiers. And you can use regex to specify w what do these triggers look like? What do these identifiers look like for, for my language, for Python or for whatever? Um, and yeah, so th this is the get identifier regex. It's a implementation of a method in a, what we call a language handler. It's a, a plugin for Python. Um, and it says, oh, we have alphabetic uh, underscore strings. Um, and we do the same for say completion regex. So whenever they type a dot, we show a completion right away. And to make it a bit more complicated and do that, if they type uh, import and then save, we show completion and do that same for return and, and whatnot. So that's, that's like nice bits of tinkering that you can do to make the experience better for the user and to make sure that uh, you don't do all these round trips. And well, th this is good. So the, the potential time you can save with, with one of these caches is like 200 milliseconds. And um, well th there's been research that suggests that people can actually perceive anything above 13 milliseconds. But there's also been research that uh, it actually affects productivity if there's like a 200 millisecond delay. And Suggest that this 30 millisecond is actually relevant for that as well. So we can save just 200 milliseconds. Th that's great. I mean, sometimes it takes 200, and sometimes it's instant. Um, you can do better, right? So one thing I also noticed is that, um, well, developers they type. 40 words per minute, that, that's like the average professional uh, uh, typist. But that's like four characters per second. So the time between keystrokes is 250 milliseconds. That's about enough to do some kind of computation or even do like a server round trip and get some kind of completion information. Um, and maybe we can use that time, I mean, while we're, we're like using the cached completions from the last completion, we can use that to predict the next completion. So the next completion is going to be instant. Um, one example of that is, is here. So we have um, yeah, user typing uh, some main uh, method and an init method. And they just typed FEL. And well, one of that they're, they're going to type an F next and then a dot and want to expect completions. Well, that is very language specific to make that kind of de determination. How can you determine that there's going to be an F and a dot? But you have all the like the language knowledge on the server side, so you need to encode that on the client side. You need to have language parameters that can indicate that, oh, if they type this, um, they're probably going to type that next. So I'm, I'm going to show how you can encode that, again, in this, this pragmatic uh, yeah, regex focused way. So what we know here is that um, well there the currently available completions at this point in the cursor location are like self. There's probably nothing else that starts with FEL in this particular program. Um, based on our knowledge of Python, we know that self is an object reference. Um, and object references you can uh, dereference with a dot and get uh, method completions on that. So if you can encode this knowledge and yeah, tell the computer how that works, you can predict uh, the future. So um, another method for our language handler, so predict next completion. So given uh, a line um, and a list of current predictions, um, can we predict what the user will type uh, next? Um, so this is a bit of JavaScript code. Um, but I'm going to walk you through this. It is, I think this one is important. So the first thing we're going to do is look at, is there, is there just one prediction? And if there's more than one, then we're going to make it easy for ourselves and just exit right now. Um, if it starts with, um, so if there's import in line, then again, we're going to make it easy and, and just forget about it. If there's keywords, um, in the prefix, forget about it. So 
what we're left with is just this situation. There's one prediction. It's, it's not a keyword or something special. Um, and what we can predict is, um, well, let's take the current completions of self, put a dot after it. That's probably what they're going to type. And then just this simple method gives you enough basis to then go ahead and actually ask the server, so what if they type this self dot, what are the completions? And that's all the logic that Cloud9 can do, but for Python specific, I only have to define this predict next completion. Right. So one thing you can do with this is actually show this to a user. So when they're typing this SEL, it's great if you have a computer program that says self, but it's even better if you can actually already show the self of method one and method two. So you can actually improve the experience also with this information. And this is not something you always want to do, so you want to have a parameter that says, do I want to show this early or do I not? For Python, you probably want to do it for self, but if it's just some random local variable that's a string, then you probably don't want to do it. So you can say, hey, let's, let's only do it for self, or if the prediction is, is a package, it's a, if it's a module. And otherwise, we're not going to show it early, we just use it for pre-caching. Um, then I want to show one, one other problem. That's bothered me very much. It's when people type if. And if is a keyword. So, I mean, they type the letter I. I'm going to go ahead and go to the server and get all the completion for this letter I. And then they type mm -hmm. an F and a space. And I'm like, ah, that's so useless. I, I just fetch all these completions and you're going to type a keyword. Don't do this. <laughs> then the next time you're going to type something, I again have to ask the server for all these completions. That's terrible. So, but it would be great if, if I only had to do one round trip for this. And one thing you'll notice, I mean, if you look a little bit closer, is that the second time they type this I, is that all the symbols in scope are unchanged. Th there's no new local variables. There's no context. Uh, so whatever completions I fetch at this location of this if, can be reused again as a location if. So, yeah, again, if I can tell the computer how this works, give it just a bit of information about Python, um, I can save a lot of round trips. And the cool thing is actually that as a greater than sign here, it also doesn't change the context. So if I fetch completions once at the if, I can reuse them here at the i, and I can reuse them here again. So one round trip for this entire phrase, that would be great. Um, yeah, there's more regex magic for this. I, I pasted this into PowerPoint and it was like highlighting this as a URL. <laughs> but uh, the basic gist of it is you look at these kinds of prefixes like if the they're safe, they're not going to change the context. Look for things like equality operators and spaces. And that gives you just about enough information to say that um, we can reuse this in this completion. Oh, I'm not going to dive into that further. Um, I, I would show a demo uh, if I had more time. I can do that after if there's any interest. Um, so looking back, uh, I showed tells you a bit about how we can do language generic latency optimization. But that's great, but Turns out there's so many things you can do with a little bit of language information, just like a tiny bit that make it better. Um, and I showed you a bit how that works. And in Cloud9, we applied this for C, PHP, Go, Python, uh, and a bunch of other languages. So I just want to conclude my talk saying that uh, you need to parameterize all the things. And language parameters can be simple, beautiful, and, powerf and powerful, and beautiful. <laughs> And uh, we're hiring. <laughs> Did I mention that? <laughs>